Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Yeah. Today we'll be presenting a case of 60-year-old female presenting to ER with complaints of diffuse abdominal pain and constipation since four days, complaints of obstipation for two days, and multiple episodes of vomiting for two days. Okay. On 10 second assessment, <coughs> airway is patent, no secretion, gurgling, hoarseness of voice, strider. Breathing, maintaining a saturation of 98% at room air with a respiratory rate of 18. Air entry is bilaterally equal and no added sounds. On circulation, BP is 110 bar 90 mm Hg with a heart rate of 105 per minute. At this time, two large IV cannulas were inserted. Disability, GCS is 15 out of 15. Pupils were equal and reactive. GRBS 150 mg per deciliter. Exposure, temperature was febrile. Adjunct to primary survey. Um, we had what was the pain score? Pain score was 7 out of 10. So, so what you did for the pain? Uh, we have, According to WHO score, we had started on 1 gram PCM. What drug you prefer to avoid in this patient? In, in this patient? Oh, and, and yeah, huh? What drug we prefer to avoid in this patient? My question is this. Unless until we don't have a diagnosis in this patient. So, uh, you are suspecting in terms of an obstruction and all, we prefer to avoid what drug? Uh, opioids. Uh, opioids usually we will try to avoid in this situation. And opioids, there are two reasons. One is it can cause constipation and second reason being it can also induce vomiting. But that will be sorted when you give an antiemetic. So, paracetamol will be an ideal option. But again, uh, your uh, NSAIDs can be given. I am not saying NSAIDs should not be given. We are not suspecting an uh, ulcer bleed or anything. So, NSAIDs can be given if there is no contraindication. And paracetamol is a reasonable choice. And uh, plus or minus cyclosine or uh, all those drugs depending upon the type of pain. So, that will be the initial option. So, uh, we have a 56 year old. 60 year old. 60 thing. year old. So, what is the significance of age? Uh, 60 year old lady coming to the ER. So, I am instead of that telling a 25 year old man coming to the ER or 70 year old male coming to the ER. So, what is the difference in this both age group? Uh, chances of comorbidities can okay so uh, what we are suspecting here probably so it's a straightforward is, thing you are looking like in terms of an intestinal obstruction. obstruction because the patient has got multiple episodes of vomiting obstipation and all those things when you have an elderly gentleman that is coming to the ed we are th thinking in terms of yeah. mostly a malignancy yeah, sort of a background and boldness and all those things you should consider a young boy that is or maybe a uh, still young maybe like four or five years you will be more in suspect of intersusception as the age progresses the differential diagnosis changes so uh, other thing it can be an uh, crohn's disease in ibd inflammatory bowel disease uh, so patient that has come with an intestinal obstruction so that will be the age uh, depending upon that uh, we will uh, say so here it's a 60 year old lady who is coming with four days history of abdominal pain and constipation and multiple episode of vomiting so so, with this background, what will be your, uh, whether you are dealing with, uh, can you say that it's a small boil or a large boil obstruction from the history that is available? Can you? Will you, will you be able, what is the most common, whether it's a small boil or large boil obstructions? Which is the most common type of obstruction? So it's a small bowel obstruction. obstruction. Large bowel obstruction, usually there will be a large bowel, sigma bowel, and all those things. And uh, usually, uh, we cannot say it is not there in this patient, but small bowel obstruction is most common. And how will you classify intestinal obstruction? Small bowel obstruction, and oh, large bowel then, obstruction. Then, subacute, uh, acute, acute and subacute, and, sub and chronic. chronic. On, then, then, what are the causes? Depending upon the causes, how will you classify? Whether it is intraluminal, whether it is extraluminal, something is coming and outside causing obstruction, or whether it is a mechanical obstruction. So, these are the main things that we should be able to do. So, a 60 year old lady or a 50 year old, whatever be the age group, so this will be our differential diagnosis that is keeping in our mind. So, uh, whether it, some industrial obstruction is there and the patient has come to the emergency room, you are managed with the pain. And next thing you need to uh, think in terms of evaluation that we'll, we have already done. 
But what will be your approach to this patient? First, you have started saying A, B, C, D is okay. Mm -hmm. So what are the problems that you can anticipate in this patient? Vomiting. Vomiting so a chance of aspiration. aspiration. And uh, what are the electrolyte disturbances that you anticipate? What is the blood gas anomalies that you will anticipate? A patient didn't have any uh, acid-based deficit. So what but you then, will anticipate in this patient? Uh, but uh, they, due to metabolic, vomiting, metabolic, metabolic alkalosis. Yeah, multiple episodes of vomiting, vomiting, metabolic alkalosis. So imagine that it was a paralytic ileus or due to hypokalemia and she's again and again vomiting what will happen she will further worsen of hypokalemia and intestinal obstruction will further worsen so uh, metabolic alkalosis is the most common thing that you will see along with vomiting and all those things in diarrhea you will see metabolic acidosis so uh, that is one thing so you should be correcting that potassium and also that what is the next investigation what is the next step that you need to do in him uh, we can go for an x-ray Okay, before that, uh, any other orders? NPO, I am, keep NPO, keep NPO. NPO. So, uh, you said this patient has got abdominal pain. Mm -hmm. So, what what history you wanted to know from this abdominal pain? Or whether it is episodic or okay. uh, in a, then what type of pain? Okay. Whether there is any aggravating or relieving factors? I'll be more concerned to know one thing. Whether the pain has increased mm -hmm. from the beginning from fourth day because she's having fourth day of pain day one to day four what has happened to the pain why that is history is important day one she started having abdominal pain day four the abdominal pain is severe so why that history is very important it can lead to peritonitis peritonitis because the rapid increase of abdominal pain always think in terms whether the patient has gone for peritonitis how peritonitis happens in an industrial obstruction perforation can be there Without perforation, can it happen? What will happen in case of an intestinal obstruction? There is an obstruction. There is a proximal obstruction. Imagine that there is a proximal obstruction. So, there is no fluid that is coming in. So, later on what will happen? So, fluid will get sequestrated there and it will pass on to the intestine. So, that is a normally there is large amount of fluid that will go from the intestine. It will go to the peritoneal cavity. So, that is normally. If there is peritoneal perforation, then definitely suddenly the peritonitis will happen. Uh, not the bowel perforation is there, suddenly uh, peritonitis will happen. Now later on what will happen, there is some fluid accumulation in the peritoneal cavity and it will start getting infected. Okay. And later on they will develop for peritonitis. So that is a normal pathophysiology. And what we commonly see with when we think in terms of a uh, pancreatitis, we say that there is a lot of fluid loss. Okay. But in intestinal obstruction also, there is a large amount of fluid loss. Okay. Where which type of patient will have large amount of fluid loss? Which type of patient? More proximal the obstruction, okay. more severity will be there for your fluid loss. So more proximal obstruction, you will have more issues. So we have to be very, very uh, clear in this. So our as an ED physician, we can diagnose. I'm not saying all those things. Our concern will be to start on electrolyte corrections and fluid corrections. So these are the two main things that we need to take in off and we need to say whether the patient has gone into peritonitis or not. So you have to ask this history whether the pain has increased since last four days or it's remaining the same. If the pain has increased definitely you have to think in terms of peritonitis and you have to look into the other features of peritonitis like guarding rigidity, guarding rigidity and uh, can you get uh, that uh, near the Cullen signs and all? In peritonitis, yes, it is not just for pancreatitis. Any hemorrhagic pancreatitis, you can get colon signs and all other signs. You can have all those signs can be positive. So always keep those things in your mind. And uh, then you said regarding keeping NPO, that is very important. NPO, start them on fluids. Yes. What fluid do you want to start? Ideally, normal saline or renal lactate. These are the two fluids. I'll prefer normal saline initially because if there is hypokalemia also, you can correct potassium through that. But when you're giving RL, we need to do a separate fluid corrections for that. So that is your fluid of choice. Next thing, that pain is. management. You said regarding pain management, we have already done the pain management. And maybe the next confirmatory thing is whether to go ahead with an X-ray, CT, ultrasound. So three, these are the three imaging options that is available to you. In an ED, whether x-ray how significant is the x-ray how significant is your uh, ultrasound and ct so these are the three investigative modalities that we have so which all patients you will say okay i wanted an x-ray i wanted an ultrasound i wanted a ct how will you decide if the pain, <coughs> pain is not uh, like, see definitely we need an imaging uh -huh. for this lady 
and also uh, we need to send investigation uh, thinking in other differential diagnosis also mm -hmm. uh, don't just keep that it is intestinal obstruction uh, just intestinal obstruction it can be a pancreatitis or it can be an abdominal aortic and some rupture we don't know mm -hmm. so we should have always that differential diagnosis in our mind but here we are just discussing sub intestinal obstruction for that purpose what investigation you wanted ultrasound abdomen it's a quick bedside investigation you can do an ultrasound abdomen there is no harm in getting done an ultrasound abdomen you will be able to see the dilated bowel loops and you can differentiate whether it's a small bowel obstruction or a large bowel obstruction how will you differentiate this is your neat question small bowel and large bowel obstruction from the x-ray convent ah. convent so you will see in yeah. In small bowel, and uh, you will see the other one, the larger one, tinea coli, and all those things you will see in large bowel obstruction. So, these are the differences uh, that you will be able to understand. And by x ray, also it will be helpful. But x ray, you cannot definitely say that you does not need a CD, but x ray has got a very good sensitivity to picking up an industrial obstruction. Only when we need a CT, we know where exactly the obstruction is. Where the location of obstruction is, we need a CT. Otherwise, routinely an X-ray is equally effective with an ultrasound combined together, is equally effective for a diagnosis of industrial obstruction. And CT we are just doing for to know exactly where the location of industrial obstruction is. So that is the reason. And routine sigmoidoscopy is not practiced in our thing, but definitely you should do a perrectal examination. So it can be just a mechanical obstruction. Uh, the fecus uh, would have uh, accumulated there and maybe a manual evacuation can relieve the obstruction. So that is one thing. Maybe a patient with Parkinsonism who is bedridden, who don't have enough gut motility and all those things, they can have present with the situation. So this part also you should be keeping in your mind. So investigation of choice, you have to send all your electrolytes complete blood count and all the investigations what you have said then imaging ultrasound ct plus or minus but definitely an x-ray mm -hmm. so uh, by looking into the x-ray what are the cutoff you know how to read an x-ray multiple air fluid, multiple level. air fluid level. levels okay at least more than two should be there <coughs> okay so how much distension of small bubble is considered significant more than three centimeter of small bubble if it is near the cecum it should be nine centimeter if it is more than 9 cm, you will say that it is uh, distended. 3 cm, there is a 3, 6, 9 rule. So, mm -hmm. 3 cm for the small bowel and 9 cm for the cecum and in between it should be 6 cm. If it is more than dilated, we can call it as it's a significant intestinal obstruction. Then maybe you can refer to a surgical specialist for a definitive opinion. But as our intention will be very clear whether to go ahead with the imaging and we should confirm that it is an industrial obstruction and next most important thing is that whether to give antibiotics or not whenever you feel that there is a features of peritonitis definitely you have to start on an antibiotic gram negative with an anaerobic coverage so you can start with either ceftriaxone or quinolones cephalosporins quinolones with metronidazole whenever you have an infection below the diaphragm metronidazole is the choice of uh, antibiotic so that is our ED physician's job is that much only. We don't need to think anything else. We need to keep them NPO. We need to correct the fluid and electrolyte. That is the one that surgeons might miss. So surgeons will miss that. So they will put fluids, but they will not think of electrolyte corrections. So electrolyte correction is our responsibility. Fluid correction, that has to be taken care of. And next, most importantly, a basic investigation we confirm the diagnosis of industrial obstruction and later on you can think of shifting for a CT and again CT with contrast, with oral contrast, with IV contrast, that is next question. So uh, again oral contrast will be preferred in some situation but when you are suspecting per uh, perforation some uh, suggest that don't go for oral contrast, you just do a plain CT maybe an IV contrast will be sufficient. So that headaches and all it is not our responsibility we can just uh, ask the surgeons to take call on it and most importantly what are the other issues that you need to think of this lady uh, i am giving an history of that she's on uh, amiodarone and she's on warfarin so that is an additional history that i am giving so what is the differential diagnosis that comes in your mind That's the clue that I have given you. The patient is an amiodarone and on warfarin. Okay. And she has come with abdominal pain. Okay. You have to think in terms of mesenteric ischemia. Okay. So, 
that is a different clue that i am giving you the patient might be on atrial fibrillation mm -hmm. she might be taking amidron for that oral anticoagulation for that and now she has come with abdominal pain so it can be mesenteric ischemia so there helps here again your blood gas analysis mm -hmm. so blood gas analysis again lactate elevation yes. so uh, as i always say d lactate and n lactate elevation will be the so l lactate we uh, measure but d lactate we don't measure usually so d lactic acidosis can be the in mesenteric ischemia so mesenteric ischemia is the other differential diagnosis that you need to keep in your mind so don't just carry it away uh, with the uh, just the intestinal obstruction but why this patient has developed this intestinal obstruction also you should have a okay. basic idea because atrial fibrillation causing a mesenteric ischemia so that's a very clear cut mm -hmm. this thing af is there coming with mesenteric ischemia or how, what will be the presentation for mesenteric ischemia there will be severe pain and there will be played up abdomen and there will be classic history of some passing of red current jelly okay. initially maybe blood mixed with the stools that's a history they are, they might give so you can ask for the history and uh, then the options will be whether to go ahead with an immediate surgery or a later surgery that again depends upon depends upon the complication if there is already the peritonitis has developed there is no point in waiting the bowel has already become gangrenous there is no point in waiting so you have to do immediately surgery definitely majority of the time small bowel obstruction can be a trial of conservative management can be given but large bowel obstruction definitely they need surgical or maybe other method of uh, reducing if it's a volvulus there is pneumatic reduction <coughs> and all those things is there <coughs> so we have to think in terms of that so <coughs> whenever there is a features of complication that already developed like peritonitis and bowel gangrene you have to take away straight away for the surgery but rest you can have a conservative management maybe a paralytic ileus you can just uh, uh, treat the uh, maybe some motility gut motility agent and all you can just wait and see and if the patient is not improving then definitely they might recommend but usually paralytic ileus like 2 or 3 days the patient will improve so that is the usual uh, presentation anything uh, else what happened to this patient uh, in the past history when we have taken she is a known case of recurrent granulosa tumor okay so hence uh, initially in 1997 they uh, total abdominal hysterectomy with bso was done okay uh, then she had relapses uh, in uh, with ascites pelvic mass and liver secondaries so multiple uh, surgeries were done so here the diagnosis is done it is adhesion mm -hmm. if this adhesion that has caused her uh, intestinal obstruction so that is the most common oh, cause if you have a post uh, history of surgery only surgery history is enough or if there is no history of surgery still you suspect adhesions to yes. certain group of patients yes uh, tb uh, tb okay then uh, the chemotherapy radiation radiation then okay pids all pelvic inflammatory disease patients so always there can be adhesion so adhesion is one of the most common cause of mechanical obstruction whenever you think of mechanical obstruction adhesion is the most important so maybe just the release of the adhesion can relieve the obstruction in this patient here mm -hmm. so that is the most common reason so what has happened to her Uh, from uh, <coughs> our side a ct abdomen was taken it mm. showed a dilated stomach with duodenum jejunal loops with transition point at distal jejunal loop okay uh, then we uh, from er we had placed a rial tube for uh, continuous decompression to prevent the agitation <coughs> was admitted under gastro medicine they did a surgery for her no they are planning for it they are planning they for a surgery still admitted still it. admitted so okay so they she need an addition lysis <coughs> and maybe a decompression of the top structure okay so uh, the key thing as an emergency uh, physician that you should remember is the pain management keeping them nilpar orally fluid and electrolyte management and diagnosis when you suspect intestinal obstruction whom to suspect an intestinal obstruction and uh, when you definitely need an x-ray when you need an ultrasound when you need a ct okay thank you